Good morning. Hopefully everybody can hear me and uh, you can see the screen. It's a nice morning and I've got quite a lot to get through. Just to give you some background into why all this started. My partner is a nurse and she came home one day and said she wasn't very well, but she wasn't displaying the symptoms that we were looking for, the fever, the hot chest, the cough. Three days later, she was really ill and we took her to the uh, testing centre where she tested positive for coronavirus. And sadly, it's made her really, really ill. She's gone from being a very fit 62 year old who could do a 12 hour shift at work, come home and then do the washing and the ironing. Now she can hardly walk around Morrison's without getting tired and fatigued. This prompted me to look at coronavirus and its effects. And I was also asked to do some work with the uh, British Occupational Hygiene Society and it all started from there. And I actually shared the information that I'd collected with the Yorkshire branch and said, would you put this online to us? So I said, yes. Um, what you will see today is an abridged version of the full document that I've prepared. The full document I've prepared is a PDF document that you'll be able to access and it will give you access to all the videos, all the learning materials and everything else that I've used to put this presentation together. So, basically I want to increase the awareness of COVID-19 and how it affects the body to help practitioners implement this return to work following the lockdowns being eased and don't forget lockdown restrictions are now being brought back into various areas um, and the risk assessment raising awareness of control measures and implementing the control measures and there are five or six slides at the end that shows you the sorts of advice that I've uh, used in preparing this. I'm a big favourite favour of uh, Stephen Covey's seven habits and when we look at these we can use this for risk analysis and when we go from systems analysis into risk analysis we ask what can go wrong what's the likelihood what are the consequences well we need to manage that risk and here we ask what can be done what's available what are the trade-offs the cost the benefits and so forth so this is the approach that i've actually taken it is serious and sadly people still think that COVID-19 is related to the flu. Now, the problem with this is that worldwide, we've got countries that are doing well, we've got countries that aren't doing well, and Britain is in the global market as regards work. And checking the figures this morning, the worldwide figure, 740,000 deaths, 20 million, confirmed cases of COVID-19. In the UK, 46,526 deaths, 312,000 confirmed cases. But this is one of the things that concerns me that when we start talking about measuring the cases, we, there's three different ways of doing it. Public Health England, they count the deaths of people who have tested positive for coronavirus and they give those figures to the Her Majesty's government every 24 hours. However, if you use the Office of National Statistics figures, they have two different ways of calculating the figures. The first one is that it includes all deaths where COVID-19 is mentioned on the death certificate. So irrespective of that, COVID-19, if it's on the death certificate, they'll count it as a COVID death. The second way that the Office for National Statistics actually calculate the figures is that they examine all the deaths over and above the number usually affected or expected for that time of year. And this is when they start quoting excess death figures. So at the moment, there's three different ways of measuring the uh, figures that we're given, and we've got to be very careful when using them. So what is coronavirus well it comes from animals and it shifts because what's got to happen 
is that an animal has got to have it which is known as a reservoir host. The reservoir host passes it to an intermediate host who then passes the virus to the human and then the virus spreads from humans to human. And it has quite a lot of symptoms and effects. And we're still not finding out what all the effects are and that is the subject of a lot of research. But basically you can actually see that there's a high fever that the people can develop a dry cough. Depending on the viral load, it depends how difficult the breathing gets. And that's really important. How big a viral load you actually get to start with. Because if you only get a small viral load, the chances are that you may only be mildly ill. If you get a high viral load, then again, the way that the virus affects the body and attacks the body it makes you really very ill and it affects all sorts of parts of the body as well so we've got to remember that there are people at high risk and when you look at the nhs website those at very high risk people with cancer people with organ transplants had stem cell transplants have got breathing problems already such as cystic fibrosis asthma or copd and again, this is one of the reasons why it's important that you get to know your workforce. How many of your workers have got COPD? How many of them have got asthma? If they get this, it's much more serious. Again, having a condition that means they're high risk of getting infections, things like sickle cell anemia and stuff. There are also certain medicines that are likely to prevent the person can become ill but also some medicines make them more likely to get infections such as the immunosuppressants and of course people with a heart condition one of the things i've noticed with my partner is that uh, when you check a blood pressure your pulse sometimes the pulse is normal and at different times of the day the pulse rate goes up it's known as tachycardia and my partner's tachycardia and now she's having to be tested to make sure that it's covid that's caused this and not anything underneath but again you've also got the clinically clinically vulnerable fortunately i'm not 70 years old i haven't got a lung condition um heart disease heart failure bradycardia tachycardia again these people are clinically vulnerable and need to be protected to a higher degree diabetics chronic kidney disease motor neuron disease parkinson's conditions with high risk and taking immunosuppressants again this can make somebody more immunosuppressants however what clinicians have noticed nowadays and the reports are coming through that once this virus gets into the body it doesn't attack everybody in the same way it can attack people in different ways but they have traced a range of areas where it does affect the body such as the brain they've had people reporting strokes seizures confusions and general inflammation of the brain it's not yet understood by the medical profession why this is so is it caused by the virus is it caused by side effects again it's all open to debate. <coughs> People are reporting problems with their eyes, mainly conjunctivitis. And the scientists think that it's inflammation of the membrane that lies the eye, that lines the eye and the inner eyelid that's the most common. And of course, the nose. Well, we know that the nose is one of the areas where we take this virus in. But a lot of people have reported losing their sense of smell. And one of the things I've noticed, it's now April, May, June, July, or five months since Julie had COVID-19. And when we're having our tea or we're having food, and she says, what does this taste like? Because she still hasn't recovered a sense of taste. And the scientists think that people lose their sense of smell because the virus moves up the nose and it damages the olfactory nerve endings and of course the lungs which is a major target area 
the immune cells crowd the inflamed alveoli whose walls break down during the attack by the virus. This makes difficult breathing and it diminishes the oxygen intake. Also patients then start to develop a dry cough and they have difficulty in breathing. One of the effects of this is that my partner Julie, she cannot bend over without coming short of breath because it's still affecting her lungs six months after. It can also affect the heart and the blood vessels. And the virus enters the blood cells and the blood vessels by binding to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Now, angiotensin enzyme converting 2 is an enzyme that attaches the cell membranes and the cells, and you find it in the lungs, the heart, the arteries, the kidneys, the intestines. And it can actually lower or raise blood pressure because it can either be a vasoconstrictor or a vasodilator. But the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme actually serves as the point of entry for the coronavirus, which is quite important. And of course, I've already mentioned that not only does it cause tachycardia, it causes the heart to beat faster. It can also cause blood thickening. Blood thickening then can break off and make small little blood clots which can enter into the lungs. And again, one of the nasty side effects that my partner had was that she woke up one Saturday night and she said, I can't breathe, I've got massive pain in my chest. We took her to the hospital and it turns out that one of the cells has gone into the lungs and it's caused a pulmonary embolism. Again, it can affect the liver. And up to half of hospitalized victims have enzymes that when tested indicates liver damage. Again, they don't know whether this is caused by the virus, the immune system going into overdrive, or by drugs given to fight the virus. And of course, the kidneys. Apparently kidney damage, when you read through the papers, is quite common. And the virus may directly attack the kidneys and lead to kidney failure, or maybe it's a part of a whole body event and that leads to plummeting blood pressure. And even the intestines can be affected. Um, patient reports and biopsy data suggest that the virus can enter the lower intestinal tract, which is rich in the antiogensin converting enzyme 2 receptors. So again, it's another area where this, this virus can attach itself to the body. And it's also leading to one of the thought schools of thought that there may be a fecal route of transmission. So when you're looking at your control measures, you really need to remember toilets. One of the other problems is that COVID just doesn't go away like flu. It causes long-term effects. And when you look through the research papers, thousands of people are reporting actual long-term effects. So if you've got people coming back to work, you just need to be aware of this. Many of the long-term effects include fatigue, headaches, coughs, continued loss of smell, sore throat, depression, mood swings, anxiety, blurred vision, and difficulty in breathing, especially when they bend. And don't forget the mental health issues. The physical health is important, but it also affects people, people's mental health. And more pe the people who are more affected with this are those who've got anxiety type illnesses, uh, things like obstructive, con sorry, con OCD, obstructive con OCD, anyway. Um, the other thing there is the fact that with the mental health, the anxiety tends to make them more careful. You've got to be really aware that people with obstructive compulsive disorders Things like washing the hands, they'll be wanting to wash the hands all the time. One of the good things here is that hygiene and good hygiene is important. However, going overboard with the, obs with the obsessive compulsive disorder can actually make them more vulnerable. So affecting your mental health. Isolation is another one. People 
a herd animals they like to get together we like to share things we like to talk we like to meet people and it's important that those people who are shielding or classed as clinically vulnerable don't feel isolated so another good thing is to keep talking to people while they're away especially if they're away from work there's been a lot of increase in substance misuse as well reported by a lot of studies the one thing about the studies i've been looking at is that they're all opinion they're not peer review so it's very hard to determine which which are the real ones and which are the ones that we can dismiss but looking through anxiety uk they suggest using the apple technique for people who are anxious acknowledging the problem pausing pulling back giving them time letting go and exploring the link to the apple technique is given on the slide <laughs> with transmission we've been looking at airborne transmission and of course droplet transmission the new thinking that's coming from the world the health organization now is that there's emerging evidence that coronavirus can be spread by tiny particles suspended in the air and it's not just dro droplet infection so the current evidence suggests that it's direct or indirect contact with somebody who's suffering from the virus and is actually shedding a viral load and that's important how much viral load they're shedding it comes out via the mouth and nose and it can also be secreted through fecal matter as well and um, the droplets are released it goes into the air and people can either breathe these in or again it can drop onto surfaces and the activities that cause the airborne particles to travel further is what we call aerosol generated practices agps things like coughing sneezing and singing and this is one of the reasons why social distancing is important and avoiding crowded places can be important that it, re it reduces the transmission of the virus from one person to another so again look at trying to thin out the numbers of people that you have in your offices the sad thing here is though that not everybody shows the viruses and there are various natural barriers we've got geographical barriers we've got the personal barriers with protective equipment and face masks and then we've got the interpersonal ones where it's actually social distancing keeping people apart reducing the time that people spend together in close contact with each other that can reduce and prevent the transmission the immunity is natural immunity and even now we're still not sure whether the people who have been exposed to covid19 actually um, develop a natural immunity that's lasting it's a little bit like colds we develop an immunity to a cold and then next year we get cold again the year after we get a cold again so we are waiting for vaccines and these vaccines are being worked on obviously there's been the vaccine news from russia that says that they've now started to produce this vaccine but again there's a lot of skepticism about that but the biggest problem is the pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic asymptomatic people in work now asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic means that people don't have symptoms but they may be carrying the virus and asymptomatic terms is people who are infected but never develop the symptoms especially during the period of infection whereas pre-symptomatic is people who don't show the symptoms but can be shedding the viral load and then go on to develop all the symptoms it's quite an easy way but the distinction is really important for helping public health strategies to control that the problem with people who are asymptomatic is that we don't know who they are they may be what we call a super spreader and the lesson to be learned from history here is in the case of typhoid mary Typhoid Mary was a healthy carrier of Salmonella typhi. 
In other words, she was spreading typhus. The only way to deal with her was that she had to be isolated and they put her into a sanatorium where she had to spend the rest of her years until she died in 1938. And if you want to read the story on the asymptomatic person, have a look at the story of Typhoid Mary. But people without the symptoms can actually spread the virus. And this is important that we isolate those people so that we're breaking the chain of transmission. And of course, breaking the chain of transmission is different. But it's what the viral load that they give off is important because the COVID-19, unlike flu, COVID-19 sits in the upper respiratory tract, up at the back of the throat and in the nose. And again, one of the problems with this is that testing in medical facilities and care facilities revealed that when they tested the full population, 56% of people tested positive who were not displaying the symptoms. So they, we know that there is a lot of people out there who are asymptomatic. And the advice here nowadays is that scientists are recommending everybody gets tested and it's to identify those asymptomatic people. And this is probably going to be the biggest challenge for you working for employers in finding out how people are because when you talk about routine and regular testing, it's an individual choice. You can't force people to do it. And the best way to deal with that is to get them on board. History is a long term effect and we can assume that we're going to get lots more viruses later on anyway. And the coronavirus is gonna be around for a long time. And if you want to know how isolation, quarantine and contact tracing occurs, then please follow the link at the bottom of the slide. Understanding the R number is important because it tells about how the virus is spreading or not spreading. And that's affected again by the number of contacts the host population is in touch with, the time period that they're in touch with them, how long they're infectious. And again, there is a video that you can link to from there. So, there's a lot of false information out there, 5G and that it's transmitted by flies. Again, there's a link there to go and find the World Health Organization fact busters. So now it's over to employers, and this is really what I want to get home over to people, that employers are now having to make their premises COVID secure. And there's four reasons there why employers do need to take this on board. This presentation was actually planned for preparing a return to work, but where workers congregate, they can be exposed, employers need a plan, and the way that we do this is a risk assessment. And we need to keep our risk assessments reasonable. It's not about creating huge bits of paperwork. But who do we need to involve? Safety practitioners have a good deal of knowledge and information about control measures, how to stop things from getting worse. But do we have the knowledge of medicine? Do we have the knowledge of hygiene? And what about the workers? It's those people that you need to get on board. It's those people that you need to get to cooperate with the rules and the control measures that you're bringing in. Unfortunately, as health and safety practitioners, we don't own all the policies that we need to have ownership of, and we need to work with our HR partners as well. And when we're opening places up and coming back to work, don't forget the service engineers to make sure that we look at things like water courses and making sure that we stop things that can give Legionella. But it's the workers themselves, if we can get them on board, it's really important. So your risk assessment is slightly different because the main hazard is airborne pathogens. These fall on places and places that people touch. So the hazard identification relates to everything that hazards can land on. Also identifying equipment that can be shared between workers. 
and don't forget exits and entrances because if you just jump into PPE then you're missing out the control measures the engineering controls that you can bring in and as regards the hazards don't forget the welfare areas involve your people so I'm not going to talk you through the whole thing but again you need to know your employees you now have access to information on who's vulnerable who's clinically vulnerable who's high risk but you also need to look at people with mental and physical psychosocial effects there's a link there that you can follow it but the main thing is don't forget your emergency staff the security staff your first aid staff if somebody becomes ill and your first aid is there what additional information are you giving your first aiders to help them prevent that um, i'm a governor at school in yorkshire and what we had we had the problem of well what do we do with young children if they become really ill well we decided that where the situation was life-threatening we would throw caution to the wind and make sure that first aid was given to those people but we also tried to make sure that they had as much protection as possible by giving them face masks and you, your first aid staff are employees they're just as valuable as anybody else so going through the normal risk assessment process using the hierarchy of controls and making sure that you follow those and of course recording the findings but how you record the findings you need to make sure that you give it to the employees and it's important how you do this there is a nudge theory that often repeated gentle reminders are better to get your message through and of course don't forget visitors people who come in frequently how are you going to give them information so again all the time you're nudging people and trying to stop them from becoming complacent because what we're seeing at the moment i think is not the result of people being more likely to catch the coronavirus it's people being complacent and think we've beaten it but we haven't and of course keep your risk assessments under review the, the, the news about COVID-19 is changing all the time. We need to get staff to report concerns so that we can deal with it. If you get reports of ill health, act quickly upon it. And of course, keep up to date with current advice because things change and your risk assessments need to be simple. They need to be practical so that you can change them. And of course, don't forget people's behaviours, you know, we've seen places where they've locked off the wash facilities because they thought it was too too hard to keep them clean we've seen places where they've been giving out defective ppe equipment failure they're not putting barriers in place that can be there and of course we've all heard about the nhs and the 50 million masks that have gone wrong the pieces of ppe that's wrong make sure that you talk to your suppliers and your buyers so that people do get the right kit for the right thing make sure that when people do make concerns and do raise concerns follow up and give them feedback let them know that you're taking it there and of course get your leaders to lead by example make sure that you do enforce the rules but don't go in heavy-handed try and get a cooperative approach to start with and of course risk assessments make sure that the simple make sure that the practical make sure that people are involved and of course my opinion here and it's only my opinion a complex sophisticated risk assessment that your workers can't interpret can't use is as much value as having no risk assessment at all but at all times keep talking to your people because they're going to have their own fears and they will also have their own solutions um, this comes from the society of occupational medicine and the cipd once you've put all your risk assessments into place and your controls into place have a quick survey of your staff use something like this and get them to put down how they feel that they feel safe and get them to rate it and use that because again 
it's their it's their impressions of what you do that's going to make them feel safe at work and i'm not going to go through what the hierarchy of controls are but what i will do is give you examples of how you can eliminate things obviously keeping the organizational organization closed isn't an option that we'd like to consider but in certain instances it's the only way that we can go especially at the height of the pandemic we can get the workers to work from home we can conduct customer contact online we can introduce contact deliveries and also physically distancing people distancing people getting people to work in bubbles and then the substitution and reduction measures again what we can actually do is restrict the number of people that come into work get so many in one day so many another day put them in different work areas stagger the work time stagger the start time stagger the finish times meal breaks is one element when everybody tends to get together so start looking at staggering the meal break times as well and restricting how many people go into places one of the best things about breaking things is to reduce the viral load and we can do this by restricting the exposure of others to time limits so if you have to have people in close contact keep it to as minimal time as possible and try and reduce contact between different parts of the business if possible again you know using zoom using online using the technology there creating worker bubbles and waiting areas try and reduce the number of people that are going in waiting areas the hairdressers that i've seen open there's some really good examples of how they've reduced this but then you see the bad examples where they're all sat on the touch the sat on the chairs the touching the spreading and everything else and of course engineering controls sadly everybody rushed to ppe and forgot about the hierarchy of controls when this virus started becoming more evident that we were going to have this pandemic so impervious barriers plastic sheeting and partitions they work quite well additional space between desks and don't forget about natural and me mechanical ventilation methods keeping the air flowing but then there's the problem here that if you put too much ventilation in and the airflow is going around if you've got somebody who's asymptomatic are you spreading it around which is why it's important to identify those people as well simple things like automatic door opening auto tem auto temperature checks at the beginning of when people come in and again when people come in if you've got secure areas Try to use facial recognition techniques for your workforce. Uh, sneeze guards. Again, think about how people move about your place of work. Can you make it one way? Can you provide crossing points to try and minimize where people are walking against each other? And social spacing. If you've got to have waiting areas, make sure that you've got distance between them. Things like using touchless drinking dispensers. And of course, here is really important because not only is your risk assessment going to guide your operational policies, but look at what your operational policies say. What about people traveling to and from work? What about operational procedures about coming back to work? Do you, do you have a return to work policy? Do you speak to people when they return to work? Um, my partner Julie, she was designed, sorry, she was deemed ill, uh, Ill to start with. And then all of a sudden people started to say, you can go back to work. The hospital where she works does have a return to work policy, but nobody spoke to her. And within a week she was off work again with really bad side effects. Look at how if somebody becomes ill if somebody reports a lot is at work and develops covid how are you actually going to do deal with the person who reports ill how are you going to get them home what about cleaning emergency cleaning of the areas that they are can your employees report ill health quite easily what about machines and equipment that goes wrong is there a fault reporting procedure there 
um, making sure that your maintenance department is maintaining and cleaning equipment and machinery as well, especially where it involves ventilation and things like that. Don't forget the public. What instructions are you giving the public as soon as they come in? Are you giving them hand wash, hand sanitizers? Are you making face masks available for them? Are you expecting them to wear their own? And one of the problems I do have with face masks is that a lot of people do tend to have their own and they carry them, but we forget things. So if somebody's forgotten them, are we going to penalise them or are we going to provide them with one? But it's a cost measure and it's something there. One of the things that is becoming um, immediately apparent from reading a lot of scientific papers is the fact that it's going to be the hygiene measures that we put in place that's going to be really helpful. So look at heightened housekeeping measures, you know, what things do people touch? How, how can we keep it clean? And of course, don't forget disposing and controlling of waste. We need to get rid of that safely as well. And look at reducing the equipment that's shared. When you do your risk assessment, when you're looking for your hazards, when you're looking at the people, what equipment do they share? And of course, one of my past lives, I was a nurse and I was actually trained in infection control. And one of the things that really irritates me is when I see carers and nurses going to or coming out of work and they're wearing their uniforms. Get them to put the uniforms on at work and get them to remove the uniforms before they leave work. And again, this is the thing for your people that are traveling, you know, wearing clothes, they travel to work, they go on a train, they go home, they go on a train. When they go home, encourage them to change the clothing and put it in the wash bin and get it clean. Um, I was talking to a guy the other week who actually has to travel to Holland every week. And as soon as he gets off the airplane, he has a set of clothing that he changes. All these things reduce the chances. And of course, you may need to get extra people in to clean and disinfect rest areas. Can we actually ask, can we actually ask employers to clean the areas that they're using? And one of the things is not sharing food, not sharing eating and drinking utensils and going on to disposable utensils as well. All this helps to reduce the risk of transmission. PP is at the last of, it is the last in the hierarchy of controls for a good reason. But if you're going to use protective equipment, make sure it's impervious so that any germs, any virus load doesn't soak through. Just remember it's good to wear gloves, but if you're wearing rubber or plastic gloves and there's no inner lining, if there isn't any lining, it causes damage through maceration. Don't forget to train people and make sure that they look after it and make sure that they can get the PP replaced. And of course, as I said before, encourage people to change the clothes as soon as they get home so that if they have picked anything up on their way home, then these things are not doing this. Um, the advice on wearing masks is changing all the time. The virus isn't just floating around in the air, it's where we touch it, but at one time there was no evidence that face masks helped. However, face masks now we know protects other people. So this is an example of how things change. Droplets of saliva or discharge from your nose when you cough or sneeze, that face mask helps you to protect you from others. But it's only a partial solution. It's not a foolproof solution either. And again, Keep checking on what the advice is because it changes. At first we said masks don't need to be worn and then we had to wear masks on transport. And on the 24th of July, the advice changed. And now from the 1st of August to go into shops and crowded places, we also now need to wear masks. So make sure that people are there. Again, hygiene, this is really important. It's keeping your hands clean. People tend to touch their faces with dirty hands. So the risk of catching disease, it's more significant from getting this disease by catching droplets 
on the desk and then touching our hands and spreading it onto our face. And learn the lessons that other people have. Within ours, we've got a big family. We've got people out in Singapore and Hong Kong. And the thing with that is that they've had experience of MERS and SARS, which is another type of coronavirus. And what they're beginning to realize is that public hygiene and personal hygiene, it's our defense. We've got to do it together. We can't do it on our own. We need to get people to do it for themselves and to do it for others. So the new normal, we've got to remain vigilant. We can't become complacent. We need to increase the worker awareness of what we touch, how often we touch it, what we share it with, and put a, a big emphasis on collective hygiene and personal hygiene. You've got to be aware that you need to protect others from you. You may be that carrier, you may be that asymptomatic person. And again, get people to be aware of others around them and maintain social distancing. We're all, this is one of these things, we're all in it together. And selfish individual actions can prove costly for individuals, organizations, and quite national things as well. Um, not picking on Celtic Football Club, but look at the player that went to Spain and came back. They nearly stopped the whole of Scottish football from taking place behind closed doors. All because one individual thought it didn't matter and he was above it. And a little bit of action by you as an individual, it does count and it can prevent an infection. And this is why I think the words of Desmond Tutu here, do your little bit of good where you are, because it's those little bits of good that we can beat this thing with. You can change things and make things better. And of course, don't forget where the virus came from, Wuhan. Wash your hands frequently. Use a face covering in enclosed public spaces, especially now bearing in mind the World Health Organization is saying that airborne transmission cannot be ruled out. Have a hand wash, keep a hand wash yourself and have a hand wash available for people entering your premises. And of course, coughs and sneezes spread diseases. And try and get people to become aware that touching their face with unclean hands is one of the areas where the infection can really spread and make it worse. And of course, the links to authoritative information is all there for you. Now, hopefully, that's been quite quick, but hopefully what you've got there is reminders of what you should be doing, reminders of what you can do, and sources of information. And if I've reminded you about what you need to do, what you can do, and what you have done, and why it needs to be done, the most important thing is co cooperation and collaboration with your workforce. If you get your workers on side and get people working together, we can prevent the spread of this disease and hopefully prevent lockdowns. And just be aware that where you've got people who are traveling around, we are already introducing local areas of lockdown, Leicester being a typical example. So hopefully it's been a good reminder and thanks for listening. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Tim, for that. That was really informative. Uh, some great information there. Um, I'm going to uh, kick off uh, with some questions. So, Tim, uh, first question here. Um, <clears throat> it person pointed out that additional controls being installed, such as uh, plastic sheeting or panels, uh, might affect the fire control arrangement. So, uh, they consider changing access routes uh, might also affect fire escape routes. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? Um they are important and this is one of the things why you probably need to involve other people because again if you're affecting a fire route you need to find a different way and my own view on fire routes is that if we've got a fire that's going to kill people immediately so that we've got to get them out so i think hopefully i'm interpreting what the 
person asking the question wants is that do we change a fire route and make it unsafe or do we get people out of the fire routes and deal with the infection problems afterwards i would actually say that the important thing for me here is get people out because the priority is getting them away from the fire if they then do become infected we've got to deal with that as a secondary thing but then the main thing is what, what what's the real life-threatening situation deal with that first then deal with the effects of the virus afterwards excellent fantastic um We've got uh, another question here, which uh, I think is, is quite a good one, actually. Um, how are we supposed to advise on the use of PPA, uh, PPE in, uh, in this sort of weather, obviously with it being incredibly hot at the moment? Uh, what, what, would, what would you sort of say to that? Right. Well, as regards PPE, you, you need to get people to wear it. Um, when I was out in Singapore in February, it was really warm and people were wearing PPE, but they were able to go away from the workplace, go away from individuals, and they were able to take it off when they were in an area where people weren't in contact with them. So, as regards PPE, try and get PPE that's appropriate. Try and get the light type of PPE. I know myself wearing a face mask and you start sweating. Yes, it's uncomfortable, but I'd rather be uncomfortable from wearing a little bit of PPE than being uncomfortable from having lots of tubes and pipes thrust down my throat because I've ended up in a hospital and in an intensive care unit because I couldn't be bothered to wear it. Yeah, no, it it's that, about choices. It's a valid point. It's about choices and it's about uh, consequences. Okay, can I put up with a little bit of uncomfort to protect myself? Yes, because what's the consequence if I don't? And what's the consequence if I don't and it becomes worse? Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we, we've had a couple of questions relating to the, the PowerPoint and recording. So just to, as a reminder, um, yes, there is a, a uh, there will be a copy of the PowerPoint that we'll be supplying afterwards. And, and as Tim mentioned at the beginning, uh, that PowerPoint will also include uh, a series of hyperlinks to various videos that were included within the original presentation. Um, so that will be sent out to everyone uh, in the next sort of day or so following the webinar, uh, along with a copy of the recording of this session. Um, Tim, we've got a question here. Uh, we have workers who are uh, for, uh, who are BAME. Um, I'm not sure whether we should have additional sections uh, to our risk assessments for these workers uh, on that basis. It is, do you have any advice on that at all? Yeah, they are they are more vulnerable. And one of the things about BAME. It, it's not the individuals themselves, it's the culture that they live in and the culture where they do live. And they do tend to be very family orientated. So you get extended families. Um, one of the biggest problems I read about, especially with the baby people is that for some reason they are clinically more vulnerable. Now, as regards a risk assessment, they, they are highlighted as being of higher risk. So it ought, to, it ought to be part of your risk assessment where you look at, are the controls enough to protect these people as well? Or do we need to put additional controls in place? And again, it's, it's how, it, it's the culture that they come from. There's nothing wrong with looking after extended families and everything else. What we need to do is to make sure that our risk assessment not only fits everybody, we can't leave anybody out, we've got to make sure they're all included. And that's another reason why we need to talk to the different elements of the workforce so we get their views. Because they're the people that know what will help them and what will help prevent them from getting the problem. I'm not an expert on uh, ethnic minorities and black people at all. And the first thing I would be doing is going to them and saying, this is the general risk assessment here. Do you feel that we need to do anything more? 
and using that little survey tool produced by the Society of Occupational Medicine, you can actually get their opinions then. Because if they feel left out and they don't feel included, are they actually going to follow what you're actually asking them to do to protect not just themselves, but to protect other people? Get your workers involved is my advice and take, don't leave anybody out. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's a great point to, to end on that, that answer there, definitely. Um, <clears throat> another question here, and I, I, I think is a, a good one. Um, it's to do with sort of the time limits uh, and when you should be changing face masks and coverings. Uh, so, for example, if, if they get wet and you need to change them, obviously we understand that. But uh, what about when you're out? I, I, my guess is that ultimately, when, wherever you go, if you've got a, a, a reusable mask, wherever you go, as soon as you get home, that, that thing needs washing before uh, you use it again. But uh, yeah. do you have any sort of advice on that element? Um, I always, one of the things I always do is, try and get my family and my extended family to wash reusable masks every day. Um, obviously, one of the reasons is because we don't know what's, we, we know what might be on the inside, it might be nothing, but we don't know what's on the outside. So when you remove the mask, you've got to be able to remove the mask without touching the material. By getting it washed, it's taken away any, any possible chance of COVID-19 from spreading. Um, as regards paper masks, as soon as they become wet, then they're not really going to do the job that it was designed for. So I would suggest that the paper masks that a lot of people are using do need to be changed more frequently. But again, there's a cost to that and how many people will do it. Uh, the other thing is, can we help each other? Um, I went out the other day, went to a shop and I thought, Oh, I'm in Julie's car, where's my mask? And when I explain, look, I've forgotten the mask. Can you, have you got one? The shopkeeper says, yeah, fine, here's one for you. There you are. But again, with it being disposable, make sure that when you dispose of these masks, they go into places where people can't touch them. This is another thing about disposing of your waste. If you've got disposable paper masks, make sure they're bagged and sealed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sticking with kind of the, the, the mask theme at the moment, um, we do, we've got another question here. Um, so this person, uh, so they work in a laboratory setting uh, where social distancing is possible and is in place. Uh, however, they've now been instructed that they need to wear face coverings. Um, this person's not particularly comfortable with this based on the hazards that do arise when being in a, a laboratory setting. What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, hmm, having come from a university where they do have laboratories and things like this, I would say it's protecting other people and yourself. And as long as the mask doesn't impair the ability to be able to do the job that you're doing, then wear it. But if it is impairing, then put a, have, have a face screen, a plastic face screen, so that you are protected and you can still see what you're doing. But again, in that area, I would also advise that go and talk to your line manager and see if there are other solutions that they can bring in for you. Right, okay. Hopefully that answers that question uh, for the asker. Um, there has been a lot of talk about behaviour and how people comply with the new ways of working. Um, where does the disciplinary option sit within uh, a health and safety role? Yeah, nice one. I think it doesn't change anything. Um, that we should try and get people to collaborate first by encouraging and using nudge theory by constant reminding. If they consistently don't want to wear PPE or follow systems of work, then you've got to bring in the disciplinary procedure because as an employer, you have that duty to protect others and that individual. And if they are willfully not, without having had good reason, then yes, discipline is there, but talk to them first to make sure that there isn't a good reason. And if it's just a, a, an opinion that they have, a fear that they have, then I'm sorry, you know, we don't impose things on people just because 
we, we've got the ability to do that. We do it for their benefit and we do it for the benefit of everybody else. And it's when that benefit's been eroded that we've actually got to bring in the disciplinary procedure. But I wouldn't use discipline as a first line resort. I would talk to them first. Excellent. Okay. Um, good question here regarding uh, aircon. Actually, um, so so obviously aircons uh, give transmissive force to air. Uh, so, and particularly in this kind of weather, can this actually be a potential risk in you know certainly in a multi-user office? It could, but that again is one of the reasons why you need to speak to the air conditioning engineers and why you need to get these people involved. One of the schools of thought is that by increasing air conditioning and airflow, you're reducing the chance of people getting a high viral load. There's the argument on the other hand that if you increase the amount of airflow in the office, you're actually increasing the opportunities for the virus to spread. It's one of these double edged swords, and you really do need. Uh, an informed balanced decision on do we turn it up, do we turn it off? And in this weather, I would I would not be comfortable in an office where if we had air conditioning, it wasn't turned on. But then you can introduce other things such as, you know, facial protection and face protectors. So again, it's a question of talking to people who know more about that area and seeing if there's a safe level at what you can raise the air conditioning to. It's all about balancing that risk. Excellent. Okay. Uh, just uh, a comment here from, from someone actually who's, who's just pointed out that as, as an individual that falls into the BAME category, uh, there is often an assumption that they, you know we all live in the same way and have various conformities. Uh, these generalizations of course are incredibly frustrating and and i i do i i do agree and and see exactly where this person is coming from um it's not as i say it's not a question as such but it's just something i wanted to put you know yeah. uh, point and that's, out as well. that's the point that i made ben about making sure that you talk to individuals who have differences yeah you know it's it's not just being people it's about people with disabilities it's about people who have underlying health conditions if you don't talk to them, you're not going to find out. So make sure that you involve them in the conversations and the decision making. Excellent. Okay, uh, I'm going to uh, reel off two quick questions, two quick answers, please, Tim. Uh, so yeah. first one, uh, is it necessary to use a face mask under a face shield? Uh, that's a good one. Um, I would actually say at the moment, going from the evidence that's available where you've got minimal airborne transmission i'd say no but if it now transpires that airborne transmission is giving a higher level of virus load i would say yes but we'll have to be guided by the science on that one excellent uh, also uh say Vane, can you use a fan in the office hey dear um you can use a fan but again you've got to balance the risk. How many people are in the room? What do other people think? Because if you're in a multi, multi office and some people aren't, then I'd say no. Uh, you've got to go along with the general consensus that if people are comfortable with that, then yes, you can. In an office where you're on your own and there's nobody else, then absolutely fine. But in an office where there's other people, you need to get a con you need to agree on a consensus of do we use a a fan or not. It's the old argument, do we, don't we, with ventilation. Excellent. Okay. Uh, there's just uh, just a few comments here from certain people. So someone put, uh, mentioned that they advise regular breaks and access to drinks along with proper donning and doffing uh, procedures for yep. PPE wearers. Uh, and also in relation to the, the BAME, uh, BAME question, um, this particular person, they advise specific individual risk assessments for all BAME clinically extremely vulnerable and uh, vulnerable employees. Yes. So uh, that's just, uh, again, another a great comment uh, and what we should be doing. Um, um, <clears throat> one final question, because I'm aware we've slightly run over time. I just want to ask one final question, and then we're going to draw this to a close. Uh, is there a better material uh, for a reusable face mask? Um, certainly for when buying for personal use, because obviously there's a lot of people that are wearing cotton, a lot of people that are wearing silk, things like that. Uh, do you think that there is a, a particular material that works best? I'm not an expert on this. No. Um, um... I, I wouldn't know. What I would say is that it does need to be 
fairly thick and triple and the spaces in between the individual fibers don't need to be big at all um and again if i can just make comments on the bame and high risk people there is a requirement under section three to make sure that we don't adversely affect people from our activities and the, the, the person makes a very good point on personal risk assessments especially for people who are vulnerable who've been shielding or who may have other differences i think that's a really good point that needed to be highlighted and sadly i didn't bring that in which i should have done Okay, uh, and finally then just a, a final question because I know this person did make make a comment earlier on which I haven't covered but uh, the use of PPE um, in terms of should it be correctly fitted and appropriate and actually we talked about this Tim before the webinar uh, for example we still have the the old question of facial hair uh, along with using you know things like uh, masks and things like that uh, what are your kind of you know what's your advice thoughts around that? Well if people are wearing masks over facial beards that's not a bad thing. And of course, the beard will actually help fill, act as a filter. But the one thing I would certainly get them to do is to wash the facial hair more frequently uh, because it can be a source of contamination. But as regards everything else, try and encourage people to be clean shaven. Excellent. Okay, uh, at, at that point, uh, we are going to have to draw this to a close because we have a slightly overrun of time. We have uh, covered the majority of questions. There are a few comments here. There are a number of people obviously uh, saying thank you, Tim, for a fantastic session, uh, for a great presentation. So thank you very much for your time today and for delivering all that information. Uh, just as a reminder, this has been recorded, so it will be posted yeah. out to you via email following the webinar, along with a copy of the PowerPoint, uh, the presentation as well, which includes those hyperlinks to the videos. Um, Tim, is there anything you want to just say just to yeah. finally to uh, f finish this one off? If I can just have the postscript here that if I can prevent or this helps prevent one person from becoming ill and having the illness that I've had to watch Julie go through with the breathing, with the pulmonary embolisms, with the tachycardia, with the fatigue with the depression, with the anxieties and everything else, it's been worth it. It's one area where we can all work together to help, help it make better for other people. And the more that we do ourselves, the more we help other people. Just reflect back to the saying by Desmond Tutu. If we all do our little bit and add that little bit together, then we can make a big dent into how serious and how severe this pandemic can reach.